of the the Family Advisory Committee who are supposed to be joining as panelists. Just to clarify, Jordan, so anybody who wants to watch live can be an attendee but not a panelist and they have to have a link that I, can they find it on the main page or whatever? Okay, but so we're not streaming on YouTube, but then this will all be turned into a video which will be uploaded to the YouTube channel later. Gotcha. Just waiting a couple minutes. Um, I'm making sure we have all of our board members on here. I'm just waiting on Lisa. There she is. All right, I am calling our Hillsborough School District work session. In. And our first item on our agenda is we have a presentation um, from one of our parent advisory committees. Um, our Black Village. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to introduce to you um, some of the members that will be speaking tonight from our Black Family Village. Um, some of the board members that are here are Jemai, David, Anna, and Jelana. I don't see them with their faces on yet, but if you guys can go ahead and video, go ahead and unleash, uh, uh, release your video. You can go ahead and introduce your role in, in our group. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Anna. It's good to be with you this evening. Um, my full name is Anna Wayward Bradley, and I'm the chair of the Black Village Family Advisory Committee. Um, and I'll kind of popcorn the other members of the board, and then they can say hello. Sorry, Anna, you kind of dropped off before we got to popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so everyone can see me and hear me now? Just hear you. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> Let's see, I have, well done. All right. There you go. <laughs> All right, so um, I would like to hand it over to Jemiah to introduce himself. Hello, everyone. My name is Jemiah, and I'm a uh, um, part of the Black Village Family Advisory Committee. Um, and I think I, last time we spoke, it was really awesome. So let me pass this on to Jelana. Hello, I'm Jelana Canfield, the secretary. I don't see an option for me to turn on a camera like I normally do in a Zoom call. Um, and we have a microphone option, so I'm not sure. I've never seen that before. I'm getting you upgraded. There you go. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jelana Canfield. I'm the secretary for the Black uh, Village Family Advisory Committee. I'll popcorn that to David. Maybe I think David's probably still joining, so we could uh, probably pass to Nancy. Hi, good afternoon to the board. My name is Nancy Thomas and uh, just a, another working parent on uh, probably working for the Black Village and it's good to see you all again. All right. Oh, I guess I'm up. I see I got video and uh, microphone now. Uh, David Steinhauer um, here in the Hillsborough School District. I have a daughter, third grade, West Union. Uh, thanks for having us this evening. Mm -hmm. 
Um, thank you for having us tonight. So we wanted to um, just have a conversation with you all. Um, and then first we'll start off by just letting you know, last time we met was back in October. So what all we've been doing since um, we met with you all. Um, and then after that, we have some asks of you all and to kind of talk more about equity. So hopefully that's okay. Mm -hmm. So I'll have Jemiah and um, David lead with some of the work we've been doing since the last time we met. Yeah, so um, we've had some really in-depth projects. We've had a lot of conversations that have uh, happened, but I think to me, if I were to pick any one particular success that's uh, been since, you know, since October is been being a sense of community, like providing a sense of community for, you know, many um, people of color in general, but I think in particular, the, the black community here in Hillsborough kind of has a sense of isolation, you know, that feeling of isolation. Um, and so it's nice to be able to have a place for families to coalesce and, uh, and just be able to share whether it's in learning or in sharing experiences. First and foremost, I think that is uh, what the Black Village has been able to provide. Um, we've even had links with people from outside of the Hillsborough area who, uh, so just so you know that the work that's been going on in the district here has been reaching, uh, we had folks from, I believe Newburgh um, and from you know other areas that have joined our meetings just because of the fact that they heard that this existed and didn't know there's nothing like it in, in their area. So we've heard that a few times. So um, another great uh, success item is on, in February, we had a, a Black History Month um, spe special meeting that uh, featured uh, family trivia night. So we talked about some local Black history trivia, which was great. And, uh, and then also we were able to have a speaker, which uh, we'll have David tell a little bit more about. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Jemai. Um, yeah, I think Black History Month for us, um, you know, we kind of had, had our feet wet by that point and, 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 and had a better idea of how we were going to engage and support the Black students and families. And so, yeah, with the support of the district, as far as the budget went, we brought in a, a, an inspirational speaker that, um, you know, really spoke about the community in the village. Um, you know, we call ourselves the village and, and I know Lou mentioned the tribe and how we were coming together and support us of a support everyone as a community. So um, that was a highlight for me and I think for the rest of the group. And as Jamai pointed out, uh, we were even able to reach out to folks outside of just this footprint here in Hillsboro. Um, and I know that we're looking forward to branching out even further. One of the other items that uh, I was able to participate in, I believe it was last month, um, was to join the Black Student Union and listen and speak to some of the students in the Hillsborough School District. And they were high school students. Uh, Jennifer Fields, I think, is a counselor at Century or uh, a high school within the district. And she was a sponsor in supporting this discussion. But it was really, for me, I think a turning point in, I know my personal efforts and I hope, and I think the, the rest of the group in the direction that we need to take and really listening to the experience of the black students and hearing things like feeling alone or, or, or left out. And uh, I know that we've mentioned trauma before or under-resourced or under-supported. And so for me, it kind of just lit a fire under me to really try and align our group closer with the black students who are actually living this experience and trying to understand what that's like. I think I said on the last call that I went through the, the same school district here and 20 years later to hear the same sentiment coming from our students is kind of alarming to me, you know, and I just want to reach out and listen to them. And I think that they really want someone to listen to them as well. So I think and I hope for this conversation that we can better understand the board and the direction that, that you all want to take, you know, maybe where you're at right now and how we as a parent advisory committee can support you because it's going to take us all. It's going to take a village. So uh, just appreciate this opportunity to really 
advance this equity work for our black students in a meaningful way. And I think I'll be passing it off to Anna. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. So uh, a lot of our work, as David and Jemai has been saying, has been trying to gather the community together, trying to get the word out that we're here, and also hearing from our community as far as the needs. Um, so we were fortunate enough that the students reached out to us, the high school students, and wanted to meet with us to kind of share what they needed and were hoping for in the future. Um, we also met with the family liaisons just to let them know that we're here and to start getting the word out um, about us in case parents and families were needing some advocacy or support or just a community. Um, and we've had, you know, like Jemai and David was saying, even families outside of the district area are looking for you know, a community, uh, Newburgh and everything. So that's one thing we learned was that black families are spread out throughout the district um, and they're wanting to be connected and they're wanting to see how they can also um, feel comfortable and also feel comfortable getting their voices heard and getting their needs met. Um, so we started to see how we can partner even with the school district and see what was going on. Um, so we've gotten different presenters come in and one was the commemoration project. I'm not sure if you all know about it, but um, so for next year, I guess there's a plan where for the different awareness months, there was going to be, you know, lessons and curriculum around the different heritage month, just to get students um, engaged in learning more than just for the Black History Month, more than just about Martin Luther King and the history of slavery, <laughs> you know, we have accomplishments and our people have done a lot um, as well. So we are partnering and this was the first time that I've heard of something where the school district was reaching out and saying, can you all come and partner with us and kind of shape the curriculum and see what we have so far? What do you all think about it? So we've been getting in there and doing some of the work as well. One of the things are, and Jelana, you can, if there's anything to add, you can add to with that piece. Jelana is also working on the project. Oh, um, <clears throat> thank you, Anna, for getting that started. Uh, one of the things that I really like about the project is it's not just the one month we cover, you know, uh, Black History in February and Women's History in March and. <clears throat> and so on and so forth, our, our Asian Pacific Islander history. There is an overlap um, intersections and um, we can the program will continue these lessons throughout the year, focusing each month on more celebration of a particular group, but it doesn't end at the last day of the month, it continues and it really builds uh, overall curriculum and understanding how we've all played a part in building our country and ways we can support each other, celebrate each other, but aspects that we still need to work on and have intense discussions with students and their perspectives and questions in a safe space as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So those are just some of the things we've been doing in the short time we've gathered together. Um, it hasn't been, it'll be a year, I think as of June that we've been fully, you know, running as a pack. Um, one of the things our community is wanting to know is where are we with the student resource program? Um, last time when we got started, we were doing a lot around um, focus groups, listening sessions, and trying to see the board, the district wanted to hear from us how we felt about that program. Um, and so we were just wanting to, you know, ask you all where we're at with that program. I can chime in um, mm -hmm. on behalf of our board, but I think that one of the things that I just want to celebrate and, and acknowledge is it's true, the work that you're doing is um, 
is work that has not been done around the state. And you look at other districts and there's nobody doing this. So mm -hmm. I applaud this effort and also uh, wanna let you know that other districts will be looking at our districts to see how do we better support our students, our black students, our families and communities. So I um, am super grateful that you all are here and uh, are showing up and participant and know that there's a commitment from this board to continue to support you and to um, advocate for resources and um, do what we can to ensure that this is successful and that this is something that continues and is ongoing. Um, and on the SRO front, um, this really uh, changed the way that we governed. Um, I think historically board work uh, tends to be, you know, you get the information and then you read through the packet and then you vote on something. And this is gonna be a way that we change now where we're actually seeking direct input and focus input, being intentional about reaching out to specific communities that are impacted by the decisions that we make. So when we get this feedback, it goes into looking at our current IGA that we have our intergovernmental agreement with Hills, the city of Hillsborough, Washington County, making the changes that we heard from our communities, from our students, um, placing uh, transparency and accountability in there, and then coming back again next year and reevaluating the program and saying, the changes that we make, are they working? Are they not working? Do we need to continue to tweak this? Is this still even something that we want to have? So I think the starting point for us was really putting in that framework and kind of uh, drawing that line in the sand, especially around discipline and how that should never be an area where we have our partner agencies um, be uh, with us. That's our responsibility in our district and though we need to do training for our staff. Um, but I think that's this, that is really um, something that I'm really uh, proud of our district administration and our board is that now this is gonna be the norm, right? When we think about policies, changes and how they impact our community, that it's not done in this kind of, you know, just space where the seven members of us meet and talk about it, but that we're actually um, hearing directly from the community. Um, and there's this, this, there's not a barrier in place. Like you get to meet with us like here, um, or we get to come to your space and also um, hear from you all. So um, that that is something that I think it will continue. Um, and. I think when you mentioned also uh, our Black Student Union that we have at the district and we four years ago when um, you know four of us came on this board that was one of our first votes is to add student representatives to our board um, so that we can hear directly from our students but um, I think that there's still work to be done to ensure that we go out also and figure out ways to hear from our students, like I think Jolana, you said, like in safe spaces where they feel um, comfortable. Um, it's very intimidating, I think, even as adults to come into like these very formal meetings and like do these types of presentations or conversations. So we have to figure out ways where we can um, meet our students where they feel comfortable and us as decision makers, that's our responsibility. So I just wanted to share that with you. And I don't know if any of my other board members have anything to add. No, they all agree with me, that's why. Hey, Erica, can I make a comment? Sure, go ahead. Well, first of all, thank you all for being here. We we appreciate uh, hearing your reflections and what the last year has been like and uh, just the work that's been done. Um, and so really appreciate uh, the opportunity to hear from you. Um, one of the things that we oftentimes talk about in the district and, you know, we we've celebrated the fact that we've done um, pretty significant equity work over the last 10 years. and. Um, you know, it was probably a couple years ago now where we were getting pretty used to patting ourselves on the back and celebrating the equity work that we've been doing and feeling pretty good about it. And then the school board started to really challenge our thinking on this. And um, so I just want to publicly give our school board a lot of credit here is that um, the manner in which um, they pushed and demanded 
and really required accountability of us in a greater way than we than we had ever had, I really helped move the dial for us as a district. And one of the things that we've been talking about for the last several years now is that all of this equity work and all these conversations that we have, they aren't going to matter unless the student experience changes in some way. So we can do training after training and we can feel great about it, um, but none of it's gonna matter unless the kids sitting in class is feeling different than they did uh, uh, 10, I think David said, when he was a kid going through the system. So um, we have set up a variety of different opportunities uh, over the next couple of weeks. We're actually in, starting to engage in uh, conversations with uh, groups of our students of color just to get some direct feedback. Uh, we too have met with our family liaisons. So as we start our budgeting process for next year, we get uh, greater and more direct feedback regarding uh, what our students of color need in our district and how we can provide resource around that. Um, it was, it was mentioned, Erica mentioned the student reps to the board that we have, and we feel like that's been a great step for us. But uh, be assured that this board is all in when it comes to this work and, um, and has some high expectations around this. And, we, and, and it's not just the board that's in. Our, our staff has been uh, committed to this work for, for many years, and we look forward to changing that student experience, like I mentioned. And I think that some of the things that also, you know, now in place is also hearing directly, like from you all um, presenting directly to our board meetings instead of having, you know, um, to go through a different avenue to advocate for students as you get to talk directly to decision makers about what is it that you need. And so I, my only expectation um, that I have for our, our PACs is um, to feel empowered to come to this space and to say, this is what we need for our students, or this is what we need for our families. And then we hear that, and then we have to make those decisions or choices and um, create um, that opportunity if it doesn't exist um, and figure out how do we do that with, um, with the resources that we have um, to manage. So I, I also wanna mention that as part of, um, you know, being on this board, um, we also have, uh, representation on the Oregon School Board Association. So the things that I hear that we're doing here, we're also able to share with other districts and try to help them um, also on this journey. Um, but I, I want to make sure that for all of us that our, our expectation is not that we come and say, here's the solution that we have for, for you, is more of the, how do we co-construct this environment that we want for our students and that um, you, our students are really the ones, like Mike said, with their experience as they're living it right now, that they, they have the best ability to correct us, to tell us, oh, that's actually not the way that it's working, or we actually need this. And our, I think our students, they're the best way for us to uh, shape um, our programs and policies is by their experience. So how do we make sure that we're continuing to elevate their voices, honor them, and um, have these opportunities for them to engage. So I'll hand it back to you, Anna, so that if you have more specific questions for us about what our, you know, ask may be your next steps. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Mark, Mark, I see your finger. No, Martin and Jackie have their hands up. Oh, see, I'm all, I can't see. Um, I switched from Teams now to Zoom and then to Google Meets. Okay, Jackie and then Martin. Okay, um, I hope you can hear me okay. My internet's being wonky. Um, like Erica said, I know that I, and I'm, I'm sure the rest of the board would agree with me, we are always looking for ways to hear from our students, to listen to what they have to say. Um, and we're always looking for new and inventive ways of how can we get student input, not just sending out a survey, right? Because I mean, they're useful and they're helpful, but I like to hear, you know, in this kind of setting, talk to me, tell me what your, what your experiences are, because that's how, that's how I learn, right? I, I don't have those lived experiences, but I want to understand them. So I'm always looking for different ways that we can incorporate student voices so that, because we want to hear them, but we can't hear them if we don't have access to them. So that's one of my goals. Jackie Martin. 
Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, <clears throat> I didn't mean to leave you hanging uh, when you first spoke. I thought I had my hand up, but it turns out I didn't. I, I agree with everything you were saying, Erica, in fact, and Jackie and all of my colleagues. Um, and I, I wanted to add to what David um, David, I think, asked what can what can the Black Village do to support us as a board and and really what can we do to support this uh, family advocacy committee and generally the students of color. So in my head, one of the things that we need to do is diversify the staff. And if you look at educational outcomes, having staff that reflects the students so that the students can see themselves in that in that role in that way is powerful in terms of uh, graduation rates and, and academic success. The challenge with that is it's inherently very long-term. It's a long game you're playing. Um, and it's hard to show progress year over year. Um, and so I, I would ask that maybe there's a way for um, the Black Village to, to take a look at what we're doing in that very long game uh, work and it's, it's so long, actually, you have to go back to the colleges that create teachers, that, that make teachers, and then talk to them about their admissions processes. So they're getting students of color into their college programs so that years later, we can get them as teachers. It's, it's remarkable how far upstream you have to go to, to move the needle on staff diversity. And it would help us, I think, as a board, if, if, if uh, you could take a look at that work and say, this is good, or let's think about something different, because um, I don't want to be going off on our own, and it really is is not what this um, advisory group would have us be doing. And then I love, David, what you said about the student experience. That hit like a ton of bricks, uh, and that's inherently more in the moment. Where my head was at was a long game, and, and where your head is at, like, what is my son experiencing today in HSD and wow, cause I, that's not where I was. And, and that it's kind of a duh for me, but um, actually I started thinking about coming out of the pandemic and we have this ability to connect up digitally. Maybe we could have a black studies curriculum that every high school student in HSD could enroll in for credit and create a sense of community there. One of the things I'm hearing is that there's no, there's a lack of community. Maybe we can take this digital world we live in now and create uh, communities that are around academic areas of study and bring people together across all the middle schools or all the high schools and, and, and help build a community around a curriculum. Just thinking outside the box, I appreciate the discussion and I'm especially grateful for, for you coming in here in this public setting and, and sharing in this meaningful way. Thank you very much. Back to you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, I see David with your hand. Oh, yeah. Well, I want to comment, Martin, because you know, some of what you're saying are the discussions that that we've had as a group. And, and I know I speak even to my wife and other uh, folks about is what we can do in this digital world. Right. And yeah, you have the short term game and you have the long term. What can we do now to meet those needs? And and I think that we can leverage technology. Um, and this BSU was just the high school students. I raised the question, well, what about our middle school students? What about our elementary kids? How can we bring them together and build that community and support them? Uh, I think Jelana had mentioned it. They are missing a safe space. So if we're going to try and solicit feedback from them, I think we'll have to be somewhat strategic and smart about how we do that and where that, those conversations are happening, especially if you're looking at our younger kids. Um, but the high school students from my impression, they want to talk. They want someone to talk to. Hearing a story of, uh, I think, in a, a, a junior in high school who said that one of the SROs there was a, a, an African-American man and she would be stuck in the halls talking for 10 minutes and almost late to class just to have that conversation, right? And so that's where I think I understand the long-term play when you're talking about teachers and, and hiring staff but that's where I'm thinking, I don't know how we pull in volunteers, how we leverage technology. I mean, and I'm sure all the high school kids get it, whether they're Slack or whatever we use to really try and build that community in the now and then start looking at these longer term plays. Um, and I think it will when the kids get back in the class. I, I know for a fact it'll be helpful to have someone who looks like them 
even if it's one. Thank you, David. Thank you. So um, that is, I think we're at, we're a little bit over time for our agenda items, but I just want to make a the last call um, to make sure, Anna, if you had anything else to share with our board or any um, ask that you have for us. I think that was um, pretty much what was on our agenda. Um, and you all, if you have any other questions or ask, I guess we can go ahead really quickly. Um, but I know one thing before we leave is that we were wondering how, I guess, as we meet on a bi um, annual basis, what it's going to look like between the board and say us as the PAC, um, because one thing we didn't want was for it to be like a progress report each time we come. So we wanted to see if there is a way we can either hold each other accountable or at least a way that we're working towards a mutual goal as we go um, so we can get a sense of a direction. Yeah, I think, Mike, one of the things that we had talked about is having, uh, you know, the different packs come and present to the board and that be more like a form, formal, um, you know, part of our formal process um, to really be more kind of a report out and also like, you know, official decisions or things that maybe we need to, we need to um, weigh in on. Um, but I'm also wondering how do we as a board um, are able to participate in a more uh, non-formal way, if you will, but come into the spaces or activities um, and have those being shared either with our board secretary so that we have the ability to participate and also being aware that um, I think, David, as you were saying, if safe spaces don't exist yet and we need to create them, how are we sensitive to that and ensure that they're established first before we just you know, show up? Um, so I think that would be my preference is to get uh, your direction and just kind of follow what you feel is when is it appropriate for us to show up for what type of events and sending us invitations to um, through our board secretary for us to be able to attend um, and letting us know how we can participate. Okay, thank you. Hey, Erica, one of the things that uh, one of our next agenda items is the board is going to start doing some brainstorming on goal setting for the 21-22 school year. And our goal there is to um, help determine the interest of the boards and some of the work that they want to engage in next year. And also to make sure that work is aligned with the with the needs of our students, the, the um, student achievement goals that we have for our students, the social, emotional, mental health goals that we have for our students. So we'll have an opportunity to start that conversation tonight and align, uh, align all of our work there. And I think that would be a great jumping off point to make sure that uh, we're in communication with our, with our PACs and that we're, we're in a arena where we can we can talk things through and get feedback and, and further direction. So I think tonight will be a good start to that. Well, I wanna thank our Black Family Village back for um, coming on tonight and continuing the conversation with us. And we look forward to um, our future partnerships and continued work. And you're Thanks welcome everybody. to, you're welcome to stay on um, our, you know, I know that most of us um, also have kids and dinner plans, but um, our next item on here is our Chromebook filtering information with Jordan. Hey, hello, um, just wanted to take you through, there had been some questions around uh, how some of the Chromebook filtering works uh, for students and how we uh, monitor those things and make decisions around that filtering. So uh, this is just a quick uh, sort of high level uh, presentation on that. Um, and of course with student Chromebooks, um, we do a little different than we do at the school because um, there's always filtering on on all devices that are on our network inside of the school district. Um, but as we sent devices home, we wanted some way, and as we were getting ready to roll out our one-to-one -one program, we wanted some way to 
provide a little bit higher level of filtering as these become almost like a personal device to students and they're able to take them out of a classroom and be by themselves in different places and, and locations and be able to surf the internet and do other things. And so we do a little higher level of filtering on those uh, than just the base level of making sure there's not access to sort of obscene or things that are harmful to minors and so forth that is laid out in the um, policies and um, federal laws around this. Uh, you can go to the next one there, Google. Um, so on our HSD issued Chromebooks, um, they only allow uh, HSD logins to um, be able to get into those devices. And the reason for that is the way uh, both the Google system and Chromebooks work is the majority of that security is wrapped up in the user account. And so the system knows which user it is and whether they're a staff member, um, a student, and what student level they're at. Are they elementary, middle, or high school? And so based on that, they get a different set of security and filtering um, set up to that. Um, so it's not really the device, it's their user account that um, applies the, the filtering and security policies. Um, and so it's important that we not allow, so those things wouldn't be applied if we allowed it, users to just log in with any accounts to those devices. Um, and so that's why we restrict to those HSD Chromebooks from only being able to be logged in with an HSD account. Um, some of the confusion that we get sometimes is that, um, well, my student's using their own personal device, so is there filtering on that? And for the most part, the answer to that question is no. So if they're using a personal Windows or Mac uh, device to um, do their work and so forth, uh, we don't control that. And so um, they don't get the filtering applied uh, that we would have on our devices. Um, and so the only change to that is if they bought their own Chromebook, which we do have some families that have decided to get their student their own Chromebook or something. If they log into a, a personal Chromebook with an HSD account, at that point, our policies do get applied because again, it's attached to that HSD account that's uh, getting those policies. Um, and as I said before, um, we do differentiate between elementary, middle, and high school, and that'll be important as we go into the next one. So for website filtering, uh, we did get a new filter this year um, called, uh, it's called Lightspeed Relay. And uh, it works both inside the district and at home. It doesn't matter where they're logged into their device, the filtering is applied to the Chromebook. Um, and the way the filtering works is it's based on uh, what is the categorization of websites. So it's not just a big list of websites and what's blocked and what's not. It categorizes the sites into different areas, and, and then we decide which areas we have open. Um, this also is much more granular than a, our previous filter that we had um, on those that was working. And so an example of that, before you could, there was a, fil a category called games. Um, within the new filter, there's both games, educational games, uh, general games and mature games. And so we make a choice of which ones those block. So we allow educational games, um, but mo the other categories are blocked. Um, and so um, that allows us to be a little more selective about which things students are able to get to. And there's a lot more categories around that. Um, the other piece is as people look at this as parents ask questions, uh, many times they'll talk about, um, well, at home I block, you know, I only, I do an allow list that I just list which sites my kids are allowed to go to. Why don't you do that? Well, our kids um, on our district Chromebooks go to typically over a million websites a day. 
there's just no way to keep up on the number of websites and the new websites and all of the things that our teachers may use and find valuable out there uh, that we could use that type of model that someone would do on their home. So we're, we rely on those deciding by category, which things we open and which things we close. Um, something for next year with this new filter uh, that we haven't been able to implement with students at home um, is, um, and now that they're coming back, but for next year, we'll implement the other classroom management pieces of the filter. And this allows teachers to take control of those Chromebooks in their classroom, the students they have assigned to them, and focus students' attention on certain things, uh, push out content to the Chromebooks, um, lock the devices, uh, push, um, view other students' devices, allow them to share things with one another within the classroom. And so that gives us some classroom management tools to use on the Chrome devices um, that uh, teachers haven't had before. And that's part of this new system as well, but um, that's something we'll take advantage of as they get back into the classroom. Um, and we roll that out and train teachers on it next school year. Um, the Google settings uh, that we have enforced on them, um, and this are some of the things that come up a lot are around chat or YouTube usage and so forth. So um, one thing we do enforce on the Chromebook, and again, that's enforced by the student user account, is that we enforce safe search. So when they do a Google search or search on YouTube, it uses the Google safe search feature that um, limits the amount of things that are returned in those searches. And then on Google Chat, as part of the Google settings, we have choices of different Google features, uh, Google Chat being one of them, uh, that we can turn on or off based on those levels as well. And so we made the choice earlier this year to turn off Google Chat at the elementary level. Uh, we found it was being more of a dis distraction than a help. But at the middle and high school uh, level, there are many students using it for collaboration and working on projects together and so forth. So we left it on at the middle and high school level, but closed down Google Chat at the elementary school level. And then YouTube is one that's frequently brought up by uh, parents. Um, and so uh, an example, uh, one piece would be that with YouTube, we do enforce what's called restricted mode. Uh, which Google gives us. And again, it's a little bit like that safe search, but it only allows certain videos to be used on YouTube. And it has those videos have to be uh, categorized again within YouTube. And so we're able to block specific categories. And then teachers are allowed to um, unlock or block uh, different videos as they see fit. So if they need to use a video that they know is uh, valuable for their students, but it, it has not yet been categorized because there's new stuff coming on all of the time. A teacher can unlock that and allow their students to see that within YouTube. So uh, they do give us a lot of ability to try to limit the access to what may be considered uh, by some as inappropriate or distracting or so forth. Um, but um, teachers do use YouTube a lot. A lot of websites use YouTube to display their content. And so at this point, blocking it outright would not really be um, useful to us, um, but we are able to restrict what many of the pieces of information that students can get to. Um, we do have archiving turned on on all of these things. So uh, Chromebook websites, wh uh, where do the students visit, uh, things they do in Google Drive, all of the documents they create, the Google chat logs, and then their email. So all of that is archived. Um, I do want to remind the difference between archive and sort of active monitoring. There is not, you know, there isn't the staff or even much of a system to sit there and just watch what students are doing. That's not the point of it, to be actively monitoring students. It's really an archive, and so we're able to go back. And if there is an issue at a school or a school wants us to check on the student or they're worried about something, we are able to go pull those archives and take a look at what's been going on with the student. Um, and so those things are all done within the system, and we have access to those logs. Um, and sometimes that comes up as um, 
students will usually find a way, even if uh, we want to block something. Um, sometimes it's better for us to um, have it be within our system. So it's sort of a closed system where students are working with one another or staff. And then we have access to that information compared to pushing them off of systems and then having them out in sort of the wild west of, of sites and different things. And us only, be, only being able to say, yeah, they went there, but we can't tell what they did. And so it's nice to have a little bit more of a closed system um, as much as possible. Uh, we do have some sites and those links would be, I'm not going to go uh, through all of those sites, but uh, you should be able to use the uh, links uh, in the uh, board documents there. And uh, we do have a parent and guardian information site in English and Spanish. And uh, that takes the parents through much of this information, how we do filtering. It also takes parents to some um, um suggestions of home use and uh, guiding pieces that uh, we've heard from other families and are available uh, online of just some recommendations of what to do at night you know it's good to have a designated location that um, students will charge their chromebook that may may not be in their bedroom um, some parents are concerned with you know what students are doing at night if they're spending staying up late using the device or those type of things. Well, that can easily be controlled with having a place that students charge that at night where parents know where that is. And so it's there just isn't the temptation to use it late night or do other things on it uh, when somebody's not around. Um, and so there's a lot of that information both around just how the devices work and help documents and then some suggestions uh, for families on using those devices, so. Um, any questions? I see a hand raised by Mark. Hey there, you mentioned uh, the archives. So just curious, like what is our expiration policy on that? Is it, you know, the day they graduate, a year after they graduate or leave the district? And then sort of related, uh, how much does our archive grow weekly, monthly, whatever the noteworthy increment is? Um, the archive will stay, it sort of matters on the, the piece of information. Um, so the Google Vault um, and chat logs, some things are limited to 180 days. Uh, some things uh, go way beyond that. Um, and Google is right in the middle of changing some of that. Um, they used to have a unlimited um, storage capacity and they just announced in the last couple of months that they are gonna start um, setting a limit on school districts on the amount of storage that we can have. Now they say right now, as far as what that would, districts running into charges around that, um, that it would only affect about one to 2% of districts out there that, um, but it is something we're gonna have to look at as we move forward about the st that storage. Um, right now, I don't see it as being a problem. Um, it doesn't, the amount of uh, space usage is pretty limited on the Google Drive, other than if people are storing video and other things, which has been huge as people have saved uh, meets files over this last year. Um, so that's something we'll have to go back through as we um, look at our storage capacity now that Google is starting to set limits on that. Those uh, storage limits don't go into effect until um, uh, July of 2022. Um, so we have a little over a year to prepare and look at that, um, but it doesn't look like that will affect us much. Um, as far as, as coming up against those limits, but we will want to plan out for the future of what that growth is because it's not something we've had to look at before because it was unlimited. So as far, yeah, so as far as expiration, it's pretty much whatever the Google, it, it's the standard Google. So chat expires whenever chat expires, thinking more along lines of documents 
you know, in the Google Drive that a student might create over the course of their career. Yeah, the, the drive itself, as long as um, those things, um, as long as the account is active, um, stay in there. Um, and so we keep those active and we typically don't expire those and we work with seniors um, and try to get them to, they have, there's a way for them to move their ownership of those documents. We still retain a copy in the vault uh, for a period of time, um, but they're allowed to transport those to another user account um, if, or pick which documents they'd like to move to a personal account at the end of their career with us. Um, and so we try to publicize that to seniors. Um, and then there's um, typically a few. And then I know counselors work with uh, the students quite a bit as they are doing college things to try to include a, a non-HSD uh, email address um, as well. Um, so that as they continue that college or other correspondence after uh, they leave that they still have those connections. Way to anticipate my next question about migrating content. Great. Thank you. Glad we're thinking about this stuff. Thank you, Jordan. I don't see any other questions up, but if um, any board members um, have any follow up questions for Jordan, um, just I would say just put it in the chat and if you want to um, I'll monitor it and let you know. Okay, our next item on our agenda is to discuss our 2021 board goals. All right, thank you. Um, as you know, we as the board engages in discussion and sets goals each year. And uh, one of the things that we wanted to do is we, we wanted to make sure as we we're basically just starting the conversation tonight and we adopt these goals typically at the board retreat. Uh, that takes place in August. So uh, we want an opportunity to start thinking about them in advance and I'm not only thinking about them, that making sure that um, the goals uh, that we have for around student achievement and around the social and emotional and mental health needs of our students, that they're also aligned with the school board member goals and the work that they want to engage in for the 21-22 school year. So really that's that's what we're doing tonight. We're, we're just doing some talking around what your interests might be and um, be, and just spend a few minutes doing that. And before we do that, I also want to let you know that, and I've mentioned this before, not only in my self-reflection, but in just conversations we've had over the last couple of years, is that our goal always is to make sure that the work that we're doing is aligned throughout the system. Um, you know, So for example, when the board sets goals and the district sets goals around equity, we wanna make sure that um, each school has an equity goal as well. And that throughout our system, our work is aligned and we're all pulling in the same direction. And by doing that, we can get, um, we can be more efficient as a system and we can get the growth that we need um, in those areas that, that we focus on. So before we start our brainstorming tonight, um, I'm gonna ask Travis just to talk for a couple of minutes about the various uh, pieces of work that we're doing to work to align. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and start the discussion piece. So Travis, you want to talk about that for a couple minutes? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Good afternoon, everybody. One of the things that I feel like I can offer as part of our team is to look across different departments and uh, different parts of our work and try to overlap the goals that we create for ourselves so that we can leverage all of our resources in the same direction and actually accomplish goals on behalf of kids. And so I'm sorry to be that nerd, but um, I would love to catch you up on the different things that we've tried to coordinate over the last couple of years and kind of show a path toward um, the board really reinforcing some of the most important work we have going on. So I've learned a lot of this thinking by working with Olga in federal programs and leveraging resources for students who need us the most. And in working with folks like Dale and Brooke and Becky on Measure 98, High School Success, we try to choose the same goals and the same focal groups of students so that we can all be pushing in the same direction. Um, I just wanna, you, you all have seen our SIA plan and our SIP plan, and you all have been a participant in our strategic planning processes. And there's one goal that came out tonight, loud and clear, which is the diversification of teachers and counselors of color. So that's not a SIP goal just by accident. Um, we've looked at research on educational outcomes. We've talked to our parent advisory committees uh, we've talked to teachers, we've talked to students, 
we've looked at our own data and we've looked at the mismatch between our student body and their demographics and our teachers and counselors and their demographics by race, gender, language. So we've arrived at that goal in our SIP, in our SIA plan. Our human resources department has staffed up in order to recruit, retain, and promote um, staff of color. So among the different goals we have from preschool to diversification of staff to third grade reading to ninth grade on track to graduation rates, all those goals are relevant and they're somewhat chronological for kids. Um, what I would ask you all to do is um, just remember that the goals that you've set for yourselves have always overlapped with that work. And even if something like community engagement doesn't exactly add up to one of those student outcome goals, community engagement can point in the direction of recruitment and retention of staff of color. It can mean uh, partnerships with culturally specific organizations and um, diverse families in order to support reading goals or ninth grade on track. So as you think through the process, um, I'm happy to support by um, resharing the goals we have for SIA, for our SIP, um, the goals we've learned out of our Cognia accreditation, our areas of improvement for us, which line up with those um, other projects too. So Mike, I hope that's sufficient. I'm happy to answer any questions about um, what goals we have in our strategic plan and are looking forward to in our SIP and SIA work. Yeah, thank you. That's exactly what, uh, what we were hoping for there. And I want to give uh, Beth a minute to talk about the strategic plan process. Um, as you know, that we re-up our strategic plan on a, a five-year basis. And as we move forward into the next year, I just want to give Beth an opportunity to talk a little bit about um, how we've done that work in the past and what, uh, what that process might entail this year as we move forward. Thanks, Mike. So um, one of our major goals with our renewal of our strategic plan this time around is going to be that alignment between all of our various processes, be that the SIP, the plan, uh, our accreditation. Uh, Travis has a really great graphic that shows how everything fits together, uh, but the strategic plan really does drive a lot of that. And we've done various things over the years. We have had year-long processes in which we have hired outside consultants to run that work for us that has consisted of kind of a main planning team and then subgroups to work on various aspects of the plan. We have also taken the step of um, doing a lot of that internal alignment on our own and kind of presenting our thoughts to the board and then working back and forth with you all to, to create a product. I think what we'll see in this coming year is a more involved process, more similar to what we experienced, um, not with this current strategic plan, but with the previous one, just so we can be sure that we have, as we move into the next um, four to five year period, that we have the right mission statement, that we have the right approach, the right alignment, the right goals. Um, so I think we'll probably be asking a bit more of you all and of our community this time around. All right, thanks, Beth. At this point, I think we just want to uh, throw it open for a little brainstorming so we can be thinking about what your interests are as we work to align the various uh, pieces of work that we're going to be engaged in over the next uh, several months. So Eric, I will turn it back to you. Thanks, Mike. Um, I see Jackie, you have your hand up. And I, I think in this case, maybe um, just be prepared. Oh, I'm going to call on each one of our board members because I think everyone should have an input. Um, so I just won't wait. Just be thinking in your mind what kind of things are um, bubbling up. And I'll go down the list of how I see you in my screen here. So uh, go ahead, Jackie. And then I have um, Lisa on back. Okay, um, one of my things, and I kind of brought it up earlier today when the uh, Black Village family was here, um, is increasing um, an avenue to hear student voices. And I think that that can align with our strategic plan in that if we can, can hear what our students need, um, especially our uh, marginalized students and, and um, that could lead into more students wanting to be teachers and coming back to a district that values their input. Um, I just really think that, I, and I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if it's 
having leadership teams from, and, and this might not be a board goal. This might be, you know, um, a sub goal or <laughs> something, but um, I don't know if we have the leadership teams from each high school um, get reports from each club, each group in the, in the high school and, and come in and I hate the word present and report to us because I, I more, I like more of a conversation. I don't know what that looks like. Um, but I really think um, I call it inclusive decision making because I just think it's so important to include the students, um, you know, the communities of North Plains and Cornelius, their their elected officials as well, and Hillsboro. I just, you know, it's so important that we include as many people as we can that it, from our community. Um, yeah, I don't know what that looks like though. So that's probably not helpful, but that's what's on on the top of my brain right now. That's good. Thanks, Jackie. Lisa? Thanks. Um, so I, I was looking at the goals that we set um, last year, and I, I really like them. You know, maybe we often do this. We, we pick some similar goals and then adjust them. You know, I, I really, um, I, I liked what um, the PAC folks said, I think it was David this evening, um, or no, it was Anna, around wanting to clearly understand kind of what we're looking for um, from this, you know, twice yearly interaction and for it to not feel like a progress report. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, the, um, the, the other PAC that we engage with frequently feels similarly. And so I wonder if um, maybe that first goal around community engagement, we could shift and talk instead about engaging with our PACs in a more um, collaborative kind of way where it's more of a conversation and less like a report. I think that might be a good goal. And then the second goal is around legislative priorities and stable and adequate funding, which we I think we've always had forever. Um, and obviously that's really timely right now. So I, I think that that's um, potentially worth having though, of course, that's like a, you know, it goes for a little bit longer, not very much longer, right? So I don't know if we wanna have that as a whole annual goal. Um, and, uh, and then the last one's about striving to, to become more anti-racist as an organization. And I would just say, I like that goal. I would like us to tweak the wording a little bit because we have it as like, we wanna become um, an anti-racist organization. And, and really my understanding over the last year has shifted and it's really not like a place we arrive, right? It's a place that, that we, we continue to work to improve forever um, and never be perfect. And so maybe um, just wordsmith that a little bit. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, next, we have Mark and then Martin, you're on deck. Oh, cool. Uh, don't be too much of a, yes, love everything we've talked about so far. Uh, not to be too much wet blankety, but we're sort of in the business of getting report outs from departments frequently. So I don't think it's that uncommon to hear what you've been up to. So um, I, I do think it's, it'd be better to have a great conversation with the various PACs and various groups that come to present to us. But it, quite frequently, board work is hearing a report about how things are going. So, um, so just that. Um, I would be curious how beholding to uh, beholden to our goals, any future boards would be, with you know cognizant of the fact that things might change soon. <laughs> uh, so you know, so be uh, creating the space to be sure that. Um, it's really that first board meeting in August that, that we solidify them or that the board would solidify them. So should there be uh, quite a bit of change or we should figure out a way to accommodate the changes that um, other board members that aren't maybe in this room right now would wanna have before they've even had a chance to begin serving as a board. So that, that it's difficult, but you know, it's a thing I think we should be aware of. The sort of the brainstorming part, like Jackie, top of my brain is sort of, you know, I'll, uh, just in the in my short four years here, the the understanding the importance of the social emotional learning component of what we do, and of course content is you know measuring success in content areas is always going to be part of what a school does. And I don't know how we create measurements or set goals or find you know smart goals that that's the word right smart uh, something like that uh, goals around social emotional learning, but I mean, you know, something is, 
something as impactful as the a couple of days ago study about the the kids who had pre-k randomly selected and the kids who didn't have pre-k randomly selected and while the content achievement sort of leveled off in the sixth or seventh grade or so the the long-lasting effects of that on fewer suspensions from high school less likely to be incarcerated more likely to apply to college more likely to go to college all of that and i think that's it may be a pre-k focused study but it sort of wraps up all of that importance of the education of the whole child, the social interaction, the being part of a group, the understanding our role in their, you know, their role in the world and helping the world be a better place that that all sort of wraps together with the content that we need to. So I don't know how we make goals around that. So I, I like Lisa going through our old ones as a board goal. I think, you know, aligning those uh, with the district goals is great, but also like, you know, to best point, whoever's the board, you know, in the fall, I think is going to have to create that new strategic plan. And so be thinking about, I'd be curious to figure out ways that the experts, because I'm not an expert in the area, can tell us how to measure those, that social emotional learning in a way that lets us be impactful um, on maybe not student academic content achievement, but student life achievement, them, preparing them for career college life after they leave our system. Thanks, Mark. Martin. And then we have um, Yadira. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, can you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, thank you for letting me contribute to this conversation, even though I won't be here next year. But I, I do have some thoughts that I wanted to pass along. Um, and they're more about where we are rather than what we should be doing. <clears throat> I just wanted to remind everybody on this call that we have a unique moment in time for a variety of reasons. And I think we should do things that are can only be done in that unique moment of time. Um, we've had Mike, a remarkably stable, a statewide recognized leader. Um, and this is a unique moment. There aren't very many boards that are gonna have a superintendent like Mike to work with and do what only a Mike can do for the next year. So I, I think that should be all on everybody's mind. What's the unique opportunity there? And I don't know, but there are some things that can only be done with Mike in the next year or two or three. I'm not putting a clock on that, but you know, you get what I mean. Similarly with this cabinet, we have a remarkably stable, just an epically awesome cabinet, write down all the different aspects of HSD, whether it's finance, personnel, facilities, capital, EDI, you name it. We are possibly the best in the class. Uh, so again, as a board, I think we should be capitalizing on, on that unique moment in time where we have such remarkable competency and stability at the cabinet level. Um, let's see, we're coming out of a pandemic and that presents uh, unique opportunities. A lot of the things that were, um, I had this described to me as ice versus water. For, for decades or longer, certain things were frozen in ice and things have liquefied and we have a chance to do things before they get frozen up again. So uh, there's a window of opportunity to change, tweak, try something fresh, uh, particularly regarding technology. And that window I don't believe is closed yet. So perhaps board goals, um, if not district goals could be around capitalizing on that moment in time around technology uh, and coming out of the pandemic. Um, Let's see. Oh, and lastly, about this moment in time, we have a very collegial board. We actually all like each other. Uh, and, and I don't see that changing in a week. And you don't have to go back very far for that was not true. Um, in fact, you don't have to go that back, back very far for you have pretty serious dysfunction on the board. And, and uh, we don't, we're not ha handicapped by that. So again, another opportunity, maybe some of the things we discussed earlier in the evening uh, come into play, um, and so I would, I would, I would be mindful of this moment and the things that can only be done in this moment. Uh, I came onto the board with a goal of pursuing stable and adequate funding. Uh, switching gears completely, no longer tied to in the moment opportunities, um, but stable and adequate funding. So, we, as a board, made a decision. We very deliberately: do we do capital? Do we do local option? Uh, very carefully, we got to capital, okay? Then the window closed for us as a board, really, to look at local option levy. 
um, the moment in time was not right. Other big issues overtook us and we did, we focused on them. And then we uh, ultimately got caught up in the state taking a look at the Student Investment um, Act. And the jury's still out on whether that's gonna be a success or not. It's, it's a modest success for HSD at best. Uh, so we're kind of back to what are we as a district gonna do about stable and adequate funding? At our last board meeting, we looked at all the promise that uh, Pathways Center, and we, we realized that that's very expensive. Okay, the state is never gonna fund us to do work at the Pathways level. For the last 13 or 14% of our students who aren't graduating, they're gonna be uniquely expensive. And the bottom line is the bottom line, we're gonna need more money. We need more money if HSD is gonna bust through the 80s into the 90s and close the gap on 100% graduation rate. So I think local option levy is back on the table. I think we've got enough time between the Student Success uh, Investment Act, what it is and what it isn't. And I would hope this board would, would ultimately get very serious about a local option levy. Again, ties to we got stable cabinet, we got a respected state leader running the ship. There's a, an alignment of the stars, I think, to reopen that discussion in the next year. Um, there's maybe an, a, an additional opportunity where we have some expiring capital. Um, if you look at ability for the property tax, there's only so much oxygen in that room. And, and there's gonna be a little bit more oxygen put back in that room with some expiring bonds. So the question for the board is, do we wanna go back out for another capital bond? I think capital shape, we're, we're great shape for, for many, many years. I think maybe we take that, that um, uh, I, I would say uh, capacity um, for the public to fund uh, through property taxes and maybe look at converting that to a local option maybe. That, that might be something that the board would want to take a look at in a very strategic sense. Um, uh, lastly, uh, to my colleagues, I participated fully in all the budget and all the committee opportunities and that enriched me. Um, um, uh, long range planning, um, advocacy, budget, audit, um, two contract negotiations. I, I would really encourage you as individual board members to, to to do whatever you can in your bandwidth. And I know everybody's got bandwidth challenges, but those are very rich experiences. The, the you, you have outsized impact when you're the only board member on those committees. Um, it's it's a really, it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to get to know the cabinet, um, selected staff, work with the administration in a different way. It's very enriching as a board member and it's very impactful for the district uh, to work in that way. And so I might suggest we create some more opportunities maybe that are more suitable for people with busy schedules during the workday. I had the luxury of a flexible eight to five schedule and that really facilitated me showing up at things that were doing the duty day. So maybe the district creates some more board opportunities for board participation in the evening or at a, you know, independently so that, that board members can get involved in, in different ways. Um, and lastly, on a more um, different scale, Looking back on my four years, I, I wish I'd have engaged a little bit more on this on behalf of the six elementary schools who are not in a city. <clears throat> you, you know me, there's a particular elementary school that I like to I like to drop that name. I won't tonight because I don't want to drive my colleagues crazy. But there are actually six of them that aren't in a city. And, and I'm at Creek. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I owe you a cup of coffee, Jackie. Um, there's six in that boat and they're, they got unique situations. Um, certainly Farmington View is very probably unique in the district and certainly um, really all of them that are in a city have their own, have to make their own way in their little unique community. So maybe the district could focus on those six. Those would be my uh, board goals. And, um, and I love what Lisa did, uh, linking it back to what we've already said. It's always, always good. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Back to you. Thanks, Martin. Yadira? Um, so yeah, I looked over our um, previous goals and I'm, I'm on board with what Lisa said, um, more so with trying to be um, more partners with our PACs than just getting reports and seeing how, how we can um, participate um, in what they're doing. And I don't know if that means like one of us joining their meetings or um, 
or something like that. And then also what Jackie said, just, you know, somehow getting more opportunities to hear the student voice. And I think not just like at the high school level, I think um, the experience starts in elementary school. So, I mean, getting, um, getting a chance to, to um, engage with, you know, our elementary, middle and high school students. Um, as far as, you know, advocating for adequate and stable funding, I think we, we need to continue that work and, um, and not let up on that. That's gonna be something that, um, although we don't always get what we want, um, we don't wanna be, I guess, complacent and just kind of be like, okay, well, it's never worked, so we're just gonna give up. So I think that's just something that we need to continue. And definitely um, working um, on, on, um, on looking on how we can um, aspire to become a anti-racist organization. So I feel the equity work that we're doing is great, but it, it needs that piece also. And I think in some ways that also um, speaks to the student experience as well. So what, what is going on, like just doing I like that systematic analysis. So looking at each at each grade, like how are we presenting things that are that are contributing to that um, to that type of culture? Because there's a lot of things that go unsaid, um, or a lot of way that things are pre presented that I think we're not always aware um, causes those types of feelings right in students to where they feel like they're separate so so looking looking at what we're doing and seeing how we can change that i think with equity work is going to be much more impactful thank you there um i will add just um thank you to everyone for sharing your input i think that um my what i think of our goals is is also looking into that classroom experience um, and seeing um, where and how the decisions that we make are actually getting down to that classroom experience and if it's and if there's other things that we should be advocating for or pushing for that um, that we're better educated and also understand what those are um, and so how can we how can we learn that as board members um, and how is that how do we measure that and then also how do we operationalize some a lot of this equity work that we have been doing it's great that we understand it now and that you know we support it in our back but how do we operationalize it in our programs in our um, ars or um, other policies it's it's really i think that goes back to that classroom experience for our students um so i really that's would be one of my goals and i think um, what we've done in the engagement part, I was looking at our previous board goal around a community engagement and doing that. I think what we've done is we've actually formalized our engagement where we have our PACs present to our board or we can have you know, um, the board participate and be out there. So I don't know if you know that's just something we just, I wanna not just keep things on there because we wanna keep things um, on there, but if, if we're making the progress of now it's just become part of who we are as a board and of our system, then maybe that goal moves and we make room for another one. Um, the last thing that I have just for myself about thinking that is very appropriate for this next year for us to be, one of our goals is to um, do placemaking. And I think about coming back from the pandemic um, and I think about um, the comments that we heard today about building community and also just what's been happening nationally and in our own community. And there's a lot of divisiveness um, happening. And I think that we can play a key role in bringing communities together um, and creating these, um, these um, activities or spaces where people can connect to each other and to the places that they care about, which is what placemaking is all about. And there's a lot of grants out there um, that we can be the agency that that money passes through and we um, support our PACs and they design some of these activities or programs and we support them. We get that money through us and we are able to create these um, 
community events where we're bringing people together. And I think that's especially important after the pandemic where people haven't had the opportunity to be together, um, but also to kind of start changing that, that sense of divisiveness in our community and like try to meet everybody where we all care about in our shared values, which is around student success. And so um, I'm thinking about how that can be maybe a priority for us at least this year is on that placemaking. So I think we shared a lot and I hope you took notes. <laughs> I know you did. So um, I think our, what are our next steps, Mike, in um, kind of getting all of these you know, ideas? I think uh, what we'll do is we will um, start taking a look at um, some of the ideas that we have around the strategic plan, start looking about our accreditation results and uh, just uh, so much of the work that we have to align. And then we'll start um, putting goals together that incorporate not only these ideas, but like I mentioned before, the student achievement work that we need to do and, and the other work that we need to do and the other needs we need to meet for our students. So I think the information that you've shared is, um, is going to be uh, not easy. I think we're going to be able to incorporate that into the work. And um, I think it'll enhance the work that uh, needs to be done on the student achievement front. I think it all ties together. So um, appreciate the brainstorming and we will have um, some additional information back to you, certainly by August and potentially before we can start to run some ideas by you. I think something that might be helpful too is as we look at the, the all of the ideas that we shared, maybe bringing back what things are maybe not board goals, but are more organizational are gonna be part of the strategic plan so that at least we're aware for our board members that shared you know, your ideas, know that just because it didn't make it to a board goal, it doesn't mean that it's not part of our overall approach. Yeah, great idea, thank you. All right, awesome. Um, moving on, I know we are behind, but it's all been really good uh, stuff and content that we get to discuss and talk about. So um, we are having instruction to reach all learners uh, presentation with Dale, Arsema, Becky, and Sarah. Good evening, board. Nice to see you and hear from you. I appreciated the discussion just a minute ago, and I really uh, appreciate what you said, Erica, just about all the decisions that we make need to get to our kids. It's really about their experience in the classroom and in the schools that um, we're all held accountable for. We want to have high level of student engagement, high levels of success, so all of our kids reach that career and college readiness, which is key in our strategic plan. So thank you for the discussion. Um, I'm, I've been thankful this year to have about 30 minutes, about once a month, just to bring different topics to you, to help you um, learn about the instructional focus that we have in our schools and in our classrooms. And um, whether that's um, you know our college and career pathways and CTE work or literacy adoption, I think um, you having your lens on it as board members, but also learning about it so you can speak about these things when community members um, have questions or you learn different things that you can bring back to our, our system to make us even better, I think is super important. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, tonight, we are going to give a presentation called um, Instruction to Reach All Learners. I know there's been a lot of conversation about when our kids come back, how are we going to greet them, how are we going to meet all of their needs, and um, what does that look like in the classroom, and how are we going to do that? And really, um, being able to reach all learners has been a goal for a long time. I think we have an added challenge right now because um, there's so much new and we're not sure what our students have experienced. And so definitely it's going to be different, um, but at the base of it is collaboration between teaching and learning, student services, technology, um, our bilingual programs, uh, human resources. It's, it's about an all hands on deck um, effort together to do whatever we can to differentiate and meet the needs. So um, I'm going to hand it off to Arsima Tovar, uh, who's our Director of Elementary Teaching and Learning and PK uh, through 12 dual programs, and Becky Kingsmith, our Director of Secondary Teaching and Learning, and uh, Sarah Crane, who um, is supporting um, all of our work and uh, is our Director of Student Services. And this is just a nice example of the partnership, and um, they're prepared to kind of share um, the way we approach meeting all needs in the classroom. So welcome. 
Thank you, Dale. Um, I'm going to kick us off this evening, if we could go to the next slide, um, with our objectives for our learning together tonight. So um, tonight we have two main objectives we're gonna work towards. We're gonna have board members will begin understanding of instructional best practices, including explicit examples. So as we go through those best practices today, we're gonna try to point out some um, very specific examples um, of what this looks like in the classroom. And then board members, members will understand how instructional best practices support all students in the classroom. So again, bringing in some examples um, of how these strategically are there to support all of our learners. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we um, do in class is we figure out what kids know before we start so that we know where to go. And that's, we're gonna put you a little bit to work tonight. We're not, not completely, don't worry, it won't be too hard. But when you hear or see instruction to reach all students, what are some things that come to mind? We're gonna give you just about 30 seconds to write that down. As a teacher, one of the things I need to work on is my wait time. So I'm sure that wasn't 30 seconds, but I bet you got a good thought on there too. Um, when we're in class, teachers might use a Jamboard. If we were doing uh, virtual, they might use literal post-it notes and have kids put them up, or they might also do what's a, a KWL chart, a know, want to know, and learn chart to keep track of what we know, what we want to know, and then in the end, what we have learned. Next slide. Thank you for having us, and it's really it's really nice to be here today. So, um, I just want to I want us all to um, I think everyone in this meet or this Zoom meeting um, agrees with me that teaching is hard, right? It's a complicated um, job. Um, it there's a lot of science behind it, um, and so when a teacher is thinking about a lesson, a unit, something that they're going to be put putting forward in front of their kids. They're not only thinking about their grade level standards, but they're thinking about um, the, stu the student uh, cultures, um, the data, the assessments that they will use, um, what success criteria they're gonna utilize to measure those little goals that every single student's gonna have. Uh, what is the student's emotional being? What are their strengths and their needs? And um, so when we talk about instruction, um, we do it in connection to tiers, like tiers of a cake. So as you can see here, there's the visual here and at the bottom of this um, tiered cake is um, tier one. And this is, what, this is where all of the core instruction, the learning that uh, comes to all students happen. And within this tier, um, teachers are not, are not only teaching um, whole group instruction, but they may be differentiating based on who they have in their classroom. Like if they have English language learners, if they have students that need more uh, support with visuals, this is where all the scaffolds, all those supports and that sheltering of instruction happens. In this tier one instruction and in an ideal lesson, an effective lesson, 80% of your students, of the students in the classroom will be set to go. They'll be able to go practice. They'll be able to move on to a different activity. But then you have that 20% that you have um, that may need some extra support. So that's where we go into the tier two uh, level. And this is where students who not only need extra support because they're behind, but because they're advanced. So it could be that they need a differentiated um, lesson that is tied to that core lesson, but it's going to support them to move in their learning. Um, it could be a student that um, needs a little more fluency. They're learning how to read, but they need more fluency lessons. Um, it could be a student who, um, who may need just to um, a higher level type of critical task that they need to um, move into to, to be able to, um, to um, um, just move and, and be challenged. This is about 10 to 15% of your students in the classroom. And there's always that 5%, that small percentage of students, three to 5% of students who need extra support. They're either, um, they're uh, maybe two years behind grade level. And um, although we're working on like second grade level or third grade level um, tasks in reading, this student is still needing supports in foundational skills. So 
Then we move into more targeted um, interventions and supports that they may have one-on-one -on -one with a teacher. It may be that they're um, in a small group. And as they're moving into these, um, even in tier two and tier three, the students are changing in their small groups based on how they're learning and what they're learning and how fast or how slow they're moving with the skills that they need. So as you can see, um, instruction is very, um, is challenging and it's it's a craft that teachers are continuously having to to learn on and as a department teaching and learning special education we um, focus our supports in helping them through this process uh, because it is it it is um, it uh, to me it's an exciting field but it is it is not an easy field so if we go to the next um, slide. So a teacher, when they begin to plan for a lesson, they, they, or, um, they always begin, we always begin with the end in mind. So what is it that we want our students to do? We try to think about what the end task will be and how are they going to demonstrate their learning? We start by identifying the standards. What do I want them to know? Um, we need to take into account what they already know and how can I connect what I know about them to help with max, the maximum learning? Um, how will I know if they've learned it and how will I monitor their progress? What assessments I will use? What key vocabulary is needed? And with that, we, this is where culturally relevant education comes into place because we want every single one of our students in our classrooms to be able to reach those higher level thinking skills that they need in order to be able to be ready for college or ready for a career when they graduate. Um, or when they even move to the next grade level or move to the next unit as we're moving through the scope and sequence of Common Core. We know that um, a teacher doesn't do this alone because um, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, a task that needs that, that specialized supports from EL specialists, from special ed case managers, instructional coaches, counselors, um, even their administrator. Um, and so it's, it's really a group um, it's it's a, a group work that needs to be ongoing um, in learning communities to be able to support students and monitor their growth and and success. Sarah, do you have anything else to add? No, I think that was great. We just you know we shoulder up to teachers and we make sure that they have what they need and can support every student in their classroom. So while we do sometimes. Um, if we're a special ed case manager, an EL specialist, instructional coach, sometimes we do see kids one-on-one -on -one or small group, but we also really support the gen ed teachers in order that all students can stay in the gen ed class and have access to the gen ed curriculum. And as you can see in this slide, it's a lot about reflecting on myself as a teacher and what I'm doing to be able to um, help my students learn. And uh, we'll go more into that in a, in a few more slides, but um, next. So one of the things um, you'll notice here is that these next, the previous slide and these next couple of slides are green, meaning that what we're talking about here matches that green tier of the, the cake, right? So we're talking about, um, these are the things that we like to see in all of our classrooms because these will, um, that's kind of the foundation of what we like to see in instruction. So one of those things is learning objectives. So um, we have kind of two categories of learning objectives. Um, we have content objectives, which really focuses on what the student's going to learn during the lesson. Um, so what they should be able to, to know and be able to do by the end of the lesson. So an example here uh, would be today you will learn about the causes of the American Revolution. So students are going to leave that lesson having the content, the information about the causes of the American Revolution. The language objective, on the other hand, tells the language functions and forms that um, students will learn and how they're going to demonstrate the mastery of that lesson, so that the mastery of the content of that lesson through the modalities of language, which are reading, speaking, writing, or listening. So an example for this with that same content, the teacher might add their language objective as you will be able to explain using complex sentences the connection between the French and Indian War and the American Revolution. So just to um, talk about kind of what we like to see with um, learning objectives in the classroom is we like to see these posted. And so that could be physically written out like on the whiteboard in the front of the classroom. It could be um, 
And especially since we've been doing distance learning, it could be um, on a computer projected for the students and they might ask the students to write it down in their notebook. The purpose for that is we wanna reference back to these, we wanna explain them, and we want students to be able to have a self-reflection and self-check for themselves by the end of the lesson if they if they achieved that objective. So that's, that's the key of what we like to, to see with objectives in the classroom and just to go back Back really quick to, to um, language objective, just want to break down a little bit about what we mean by language function and language forms. So language function is what we do with the language. It's the purpose of the language. So um, examples of this could be cause and effect, compare and contrast, sequencing of events, right? So that's like how we use the language for a very specific purpose. The forms are the intentional grammatical structures that support that language function. So it could be um, specific verb tenses you want to use with sequencing, right, that you might be wanting to hear from your students or see written in the students work that day. So this is really deliberate and purposeful because as we know, a language is the key often for students to be able to to demonstrate um, their their learning in the classroom. So next slide is effective instructional strategies. So there are thousands of instructional strategies, like literally thousands of instructional strategies that we see our teachers use on a typical basis. So we just pulled out some of the like most popular ones or like just kind of a sampling here to, to get an idea of what we're talking about. And so um, small group rotation is one that um, is commonly used at all levels, K through um, 12, pre-K through 12. Um, in elementary, um, uh, a, a structure you might see for this is some teachers use what's called the daily five, which students are rotating through five rotations. And what is great about these rotations is that um, you get students to have the opportunity to do some individual work, some um, peer work with their peers, but also it allows often for a station with um, the teacher being able um, or support staff to be able to work it with a small group of students for a very targeted purpose. So this allows for some of that um, differentiation to happen as well um, with the educator. Chalk Talk is an activity that um, often allows for, um, it's generally done quietly. And so it starts with an idea or question that then students build off of. Um, and this can be a really great activity for students who, whose voices might not be as loud um, or dominant in a classroom, but still have really great ideas that maybe their way of sharing isn't by raising their hand and volunteering to share information. So Chalk Talk is a really great opportunity um, for that. Number corner is a strategy that we use in partnership with our um, K-5 math curriculum with bridges. And this is a really good example of an activity that can be used for high engagement at low risk. So um, it, it, I, I have not been an elementary teacher myself, but I have a second grade son who engages in number corner on a daily basis. And you get to hear fun things like, tell me everything you know about number seven, right? And there's really no wrong answer to that. So it, ha it provides the opportunity for students to um, have their voice heard, give ideas um, at, at a pretty low risk of being right or wrong. And then um, the other one we have on there is Socratic seminar. This is um, a really great activity to engage some of those critical thinking examination and peer collaboration that we like to see. Um, we do a lot of, this is um, a strategy that's a very closely paired with um, AVID. So we see this as a very um, commonly highlighted AVID strategy and um, this idea of having kind of an inner circle and an outer circle. So you have your students who might be directly participating in the discussion while other kids are kind of their co-pilot and might be giving their inner circle participants um, information. The last thing that we don't necessarily have a visual for on here, but I think is really important to mention and um, that we find um, to be kind of a cornerstone 
cornerstone of what we do in Hillsborough School District now is our social emotional learning. And we see that coming in our uh, morning circles. And so that's in all of our K-6 classrooms. We have on a regular basis, um, pretty much daily, we start our day with our students in a morning circle where we're checking in with students. We're talking about that social emotional learning, talking about our, our feelings and why we're feeling certain things. And then at the secondary level with advisory. So we've added those advisories um, at all of our middle schools and high schools this year. And I've really been um, seeing the benefits of that for us to engage with our students in a, in a different way than kind of that traditional academic way. But I would argue just as important of a way to engage with our students. Becky, do you want questions or do you want at the end or when we have them? Um, probably the end I think would be better. Okay. Is that, is that good? Continue. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Next slide, please. Thank you for having questions, but I agree. Uh, we'll lose our train of thought here if we jump into questions right now. So um, scaffolding and differentiation, notice that the color just changed of the slides and we're into some tier two supports. And that's because not everyone needs scaffolding or differentiation, but some kids do. And if you need scaffolding or differentiation, you don't need, that doesn't mean you can't access the grade level content and curriculum. It just means you might need a little bit different help. So for example, you can see the two ladders here. Um, if I had to paint a ceiling, I would need a ladder at least as tall as the three-step ladder, but maybe even taller. There are some people who are taller than me and they might need just the two-step ladder. And that's just a scaffold, right? We're just going to give the people, uh, we're going to give people what they need for the task at hand. So um, we can both paint a ceiling, two of us can paint a ceiling, but we might need different supports. And it's the same in the classroom. Um, teachers teach their, their lessons, but they also think about now, what will the student need to really access that? Will they need a graphic organizer to be able to write that essay? Will they need a calculator to be able to do those math problems? Because I don't really care if they can memorize one plus one. I do care if they know when they're supposed to add in a story problem that they're supposed to add those two numbers and how to use the calculator to make it happen. So we really focus on what is it and you know we go back to what our SAMA started with with the um, beginning with the end in mind. What is it that we really really want the student to know and learn and how can we get them there with supports? Next slide please. Um, our Sam mentioned as well that teachers, um, it, you know, being a great teacher is a really hard job and we have some amazing, great, wonderful teachers in HSD. One of the things they do is monitor and adjusting in real time. And often what happens is if someone comes and watches your classroom, um, if you're a board member coming to see a classroom or a community volunteer or a student teacher and you're in there watching a great lesson, you have no idea what's going on. In, in that teacher's mind because it looks seamless, it's easy. It's, it just looks like they do this every day, it's no big deal. What you don't realize is that literally hundreds of questions and, and thoughts and decisions are being made during that lesson. So for example, you know, is Pablo looking out the window because I haven't given him enough of a challenge with this lesson? Is Sarah not understanding this piece or what is it? Maybe it's that piece. Um, if I use these specific numbers for this example, will the students be able to understand that that's gonna work in this other type of math example, right? How can I choose my numbers just perfectly? Um, gosh, I'm in the middle of my lesson and it's like the best lesson I think I've ever created, but the faces I'm getting back, the looks I'm getting back from the kids are saying, I don't get what you're saying, Sarah, or I guess they wouldn't call me Sarah, right? But I don't get what you're saying, teacher. So you have to adjust in real time. And it's so hard for great teachers to explain what's happening in their head, but it is masterful to watch it happen. They are making changes left and right the whole time and doing just little things. Where am I standing in the room? What um, colors am I gonna use to give this example that will really make this one part pop? And, and these are just things that they do naturally and um, are really so good at it that we don't even notice. Next slide, please. So as Sarah was saying, um, teachers are constantly having to reflect on their instruction. And the reflection is actually a self-reflection of how, as a teacher, I'm delivering the lesson. Uh, because it's important for us to under, um, understand and, and, and know that um, students, as Sarah was explaining, and she did a beautiful job illustrating how when students are not getting what I'm saying, it could be because of how I'm saying it. And so I need to really reflect on that and under and, and get to, to the point where I I have to like stop 
and then think about how do I, how can I change what I'm teaching in order to get my students to learn the skill or the or the or the or get to the goal of the lesson. And so we know that if we do more of the same, that's not going to solve the problem, right? And so having that uh, collegial um, collaboration with your grade level teams or with your department is so essential because. Um, then you get another perspective, right? And, and you, you can also get um, feedback on how it worked for other teachers. And so then um, we have interventions in place that help with um, helping us deliver this, the lessons in different ways. And so an intervention is not about putting a student who's below grade level in this intervention for the whole year. It's about putting them there from, you know, we, we tend to go four to six weeks in a um, intervention program or in a specific way of delivering that lesson and um, monitor their growth. And then based on that, try something new, or maybe they're out of that intervention because they did reach their goal. And so that they can, you know, move back into the, into like the whole group core. And so there's, um, a lot of uh, supports that not only um, they need from each other, but also their administrators uh, provides for them. And also we as a teaching and learning department provide for our teachers in order to support them with uh, putting or with deciding what students would go into interventions and what types of interventions they need. So accommodations and modifications are something that sometimes we offer for students. Um, and I'm gonna give you some examples of how we use them in our everyday life as well. Basically an accommodation means that you're still accessing the exact same standards. You just need some sort of support to do that. An example of that would be the glasses that I have on my face and I see several other people on the screen. Without my glasses, this isn't as clear. I can completely read it. I just need the glasses, right? Another example in this picture here is training wheels. Like I can do the whole race. If there's a bike race, I can do the whole thing, but I need training wheels to be able to do it. Some people do, some people don't, right? Um, modifications are just a little bit different because we're actually going to change the standards for modifications. And um, this is something that we talk about a lot and it's still confusing to a lot of people. So if at the end of today, you need to email me and say, I still don't get it. It's okay, I'll give you more examples. Um, but so a modification actually changes the standards or reduces the standards. So um, if I was not going to read this at all um, and no one was gonna require me to for this um, presentation, then that might be a modification. That's not the best example. A better example is the same bike race where um, we say, okay, actually I'm gonna have you start halfway to the finish line. So everyone else is gonna start way back here. You're gonna start here because maybe you have an impairment that makes it so you walk slower or ride your bike slower. And so you're not actually having to do the whole race but you still get to participate in the race and do a portion of it. And I think it's really key to know that with all these, with interventions, with accommodations and with modifications, and I know I've said this before but every student is in the regular class. They're learning the regular material with the regular teacher who is trained in that content. And so, um, Everyone else around is there to support and help with interventions, with accommodations, with modifications, because um, the, the kids can learn the, the standards and be a part of the curriculum. All right, next slide. So um, now we're starting to talk about how do we how do we know what students have learned in the multiple modes that students can share what they've learned with us. Um, so kind of going to target three different kind of chunks here in discussion in discussing that. The first one is um, formative versus summative assessment. And um, again, this this whole part we're talking about here kind of goes back to the beginning of the presentation where we said talk about um, start with the end in mind, right? Because ideally you know what what you're going to be assessing for and what you want to see but the very first day right so it's not like where did they get in, in, in just kind of a guessing game? The, the whole idea is that by, by the first day of that unit or that instruction, we know exactly what we want them to do at the end point. Um, so formative is really where we're talking about that checking in along the way. So this is like constant. As Sarah mentioned, those like teacher moves that they're making in their head of like, what do I do here? What do I do there? That's all a result of formative assessment data. So um, this does not, when, when I say the word assessment here, I think it's really important 
important to think broad because a formative assessment could be a teacher listening into a conversation with two students based on a discussion question I had on the board. A formative assessment could be an exit ticket at the end of the lesson where I have students respond to um, respond to some sort of, uh, maybe it's the objective that I had on the board at the beginning of the day to give me information about like if I did a good job. But I think the thing that's most important to know about formative assessment, that is information for the educator about what moves they need to make, right? Not what the kids need to do differently, but what I as the educator need to do differently so that I can better support the students in the classroom with their learning because that's the adjustment I need to make as the expert in the as the expert educator in the room right that summative assessment is the um, that's the kind of end of the learning point so whether that's like the end of the unit the end of the, you know whatever however you sequenced your learning that year and this is where we want to know like the summation of everything we learned did they get that kind of final outcome again think broad here. It could be kind of what we might think traditionally as like a unit assessment, but um, that could also be like a group project. It could be a speech. It could be a building something, right? It thinks so. there's a lot of different things that still could count as kind of that summative assessment beyond what we might typically think as um, a test. The next section we hear is like, what is that core competency and standard we're measuring? So again, think with the end in mind. So if you go back to um, what we want the kids to know, how are we going to ask them to demonstrate their learning in this? And I think this is really important point for us to mention culturally responsive education, right? Because I think that when we think of what it means to be culturally responsive, that's when we're holding all of our, all of our students to that high cognitive rigor. We're being the warm demanders coming alongside students and saying, um, we can do this. What supports do you need? I believe in you right? Like here's a way that you can demonstrate it to me. And I think that's really important when we talk about multiple modes to demonstrate learning is if my standard is wanting to get information about the causes of the American revolution, let's say going back to that um, content objective I had at the beginning, and I'm asking students to demonstrate that in an essay, and maybe though that's getting in way, the student's ability to kind of complete that essay is getting in the way of them being able to demonstrate their learning on the causes of the American Revolution. What's another way I can get that student to demonstrate their understanding and learning to me, right? Is that through a project? Is that through an oral speech? Is that through um, something that even the student and I sitting next to each other and having a discussion about it, right? So I think thinking flexibly, which then brings us to that last section, which is especially important to that high school conversation when we're talking about credit and especially in the context of this year and a previous board presentation that Dale and I did a few months ago, is this idea of flexibility and awarding credit based on the proficiency of that standard and that learning, right? And this is supported by our board policy. We have board policy that says that we can have alternative instructional arrangements that allows for flexibility in students to demonstrate their understanding and learning. But um, Oregon Department of Education also came out with some new updated guidance this year that really broadened that flexibility for us to award credit based on the student being able to demonstrate their understanding and proficiency in the standards in multiple ways. And so this is this is that lift, especially for our high school teachers this year, and how can we be flexible and support our students in demonstrating that learning and earning those credits. Next, please. So um, we usually use an exit ticket as we um, finish our lessons. And we use, use that as a formative assessment as well to see what else I need to teach. How do I need to adjust my next steps? Um, do I need to review something with the students? Do I need to um, do a different differentiated lesson? Um, so I'm gonna have you, you can either use that sentence frame that is here based on what you've heard in the last 20, 25 minutes, um, explain what instruction, so instruction strategies for all mean to you. Um, how does it compare to your original definition? So we'll give you 30 seconds to jot, you know, jot something down or think about it.
And we're hoping that um, as you finish writing your statement or drawing your picture or uh, writing bullet points that um, you've increased your knowledge about what um, instruction means in, in HSD. So uh, if we go to the next slide. This is the time for questions. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I'm looking to see if I see any hand raised. Um, while, while that's happening, I, I like the, um, the summative assessment at the end for us to see what we learned in the 20, 25 minutes. Um, and initially I had written down that, um, you know, uh, what does our students need? And then I really like the part where you also talked about how do we as teachers adapt um, and change to, to meet those needs. Um, and I think the only questions that I had was around just the instruction um, strategies, the different strategies that you showed on there. If there are, um, um, if they're like either research or studies or best practices on which ones work for what material or for what type of engagement and that's how you kind of guide. I just wanted to just clarify that if there's like a, um, a strategy behind which ones you use and why. Um, and after you answer that, Martin, you can go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, Erica, because um, you, it's important when we, when we choose our instructional strategies that they match that outcome and that standard, right? So like, we shouldn't just be doing a bunch of fun active things because they're fun and active things, right? Like it's for a purpose. So um, yes, there is, there is all sorts, like there's the educational gurus that I kind of go to for that kind of stuff. There's Marzano, there's Hattie, right? There's, there's those researchers that, um, you often call them high leverage strategies. And what they mean that high leverage is that you're gonna get your most bang for your buck by doing this strategy for this purpose coupled with that, right? So um, so absolutely, that is stuff that, that we highlight in our professional development with teachers of this is the strategy and this is why you would use it in this instance. Thank you. Um, I see Martin and then Mark. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Arsema and Sarah and Becky. For an awesome presentation and it wasn't a question as much as a comment i in the spectrum of interventions and accommodations and modifications as tools in that toolbox to make sure kids are, are learning students are learning I, I now understand the term modified diploma and i i know why that is the term applied to that so thank you very much for helping me understand that thanks martin mark uh yeah so such, such a great presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, and I, I think I was able to tie my first one to my last, my end one, like somewhat. Uh, and I, I don't know that I can crystallize the question. So this might be a little rambly. So I apologize for that. Um, there was a lot to think about in there. Um, and I, so if we unencumber the words from their traditional context in the educational setting, and just think about the colloquial use of these words, um, what is stopping us from every student having an individualized education program? So we don't think of it in special, just think about those words in a colloquial sense. Like, is it just too expensive? We need one-to-one -one teachers. Is it technology? Is it just a bad idea? Like uh, just sort of thinking about sort of the levels and how 80% of So uh, what is the main barrier between uh, school district providing sort of very individualized focus for whatever a student needs. Well, besides a whole bunch of paperwork, I would say <laughs> as the special ed person- No, you're covering it with the special ed. You're this, covering I know, it with we're the taking that away. Kind of, okay, if we take, take that, that away. away, I'm good, no. Um, so I I think that there's a couple, a couple of things come to mind and then I'm sure other people on the screen may have ideas, but um, one is that in some ways we do. Right. In some ways, we do use supports and differentiation, and we know our kids by name, strength, and need because that's how they learn best. Right. When we really know if I connect this math problem with soccer, I'm totally going to bring Mark in. He is going to be all over this math problem. If I connect it to dance, he's going to tune out and not listen to me. So, guess what? I'm going to use soccer. Right. Um, we also, when we do these great um, tools and strategies, Remember that we're going to hit about 80% of the kids. 
So they don't need extra supports, extra differentiation to the extent that anyone doesn't need it, right? I mean, I you could say in a board meeting, any of us at any point might need a little extra something, but I think that's probably part of the thing. And then I would say just as your special ed director, um, it, special ed is very, um, very law bound and very paperwork driven yeah, I'm, and i'm trying that so don't even right. forget i use those words let's call it no, unique I educational only, experience yeah it's i think the, i think uh, in some ways we do U E E. why don't we have, why doesn't everyone have a uee -E, a unique educational experience perfect perfect take those words out of it i um, feel like i want to share with you all kinds of fun things like why do we have kids <laughs> in second grade when they're seven sure Mark, you may be stealing a little bit of thunder about what we're um, trying to think about as we move into the future. We've had conversations about the fact that we, and I hope nobody's like, why is she saying this? But we've had conversations about the fact that mm -hmm. we've said, we want to know every child by name, strength, and need. And I think we're getting further down that path. But there's only so much that we from the outside can do for our kids. We want to do things with our kids. We want them to know themselves by name, strength, and need, their own identity, their own strengths, their own needs, to be able to advocate for what they need, learn in different ways, um, to be able to connect with each other and the world around them, you know, in this very lofty way, but basically know themselves because no matter what child you have, there's going to be nuances that are unique to them that are different from someone else and all should be celebrated. So how do we get our kids give them the space to know themselves, to connect with different things and to have pathways for career and college like K-12. Um, you know, Martin said a lot of times like that pathway center is expensive. It's that 15% where you, you're looking at this data where it's like 80% of our kids and we're up to 84, we're even up to 91% of our kids graduating in five years, which is awesome. But are they career and college ready? Do they know themselves? Do they know their passions? You know, do they have their own EA? P or EUP or whatever you just called, like, do, do they know what, what fuels them up? And then how do we help our teachers provide opportunities for like those Socratic seminars where kids can learn? I mean, we, as parents and aunts and uncles, um, you know that there are times you watch a student and they weren't passionate about something, chess, band, um, the Civil War, until they learned about it. And then they were like, oh, wow, that's my passion. So how do we keep offering opportunities to kids in this land of predictive tech and um, you know other things? How do we keep continually opening up the world to our kids so they can have their own EUP that they drive themselves and that we come alongside with them? Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we are really behind time, but this was a really great, another really great topic. And I'm sure we would have more conversation and discussion. And I think that it's an area where maybe we ask to come back and have additional time um, just to ask more in-depth questions. But I appreciate your time and all of the work that you do for our kids. So thank you. Our next item on our agenda is our school resource um, officer update with Mike, Morgan, and Alex. All right, this is a fairly quick one. Um, thanks to our last presenters, really appreciated that information, really good stuff, thank you. Um, we wanted to make sure we came back and let you know that we do have a draft or, uh, or a final copy of, a final draft, I should say, of the um, agreement with Washington County. You'll remember that uh, we went over pretty extensively the, one, uh, the agreement with HPD. Um, Washington County is largely the same. It holds to the same values and the same concepts. Um, there, there are a few differences that um, as various attorneys from different agencies get involved um, need to be tweaked and adjusted. But I wanna give the floor to Morgan and Alex to just highlight any, any differences that you might see in this and then remind you that on May 25th, we will be uh, voting to approve these. So um, Morgan and Alex. Thank you. I feel like I need to do a like, she's back for every time I'm here for SROs. Um, so thank you for letting me be here again and for um, really being so committed to making sure we get this right for our kids because that's why we've been able to draw this out so long and make sure that we're being very intentional um, with every decision that we make. And so one shift or one thing you might notice, probably will notice is that for Washington County, we have a 0.5 
um, FTE for SRO. So that's one of the significant changes is just the number of SROs that we work with in Washington County compared to HPD. Um, another change, and this is partly due to the, um, to the staffing, is that the summer program pieces have been taken out. Although um, we have traditionally still had our SRO support during the summer with different things, um, and they work more than the required or, or minimum amount, I guess, at our schools too. So we definitely get uh, the time and um, the SRO that we've had from the county, Nate, is, is phenomenal and builds great relationships with kids. And he's also serving multiple schools that are kind of on the periphery. So just being able to logistically get around, um, he's been doing a great job with that. Um, the other thing is just there's a little differences for their the uniform and that's specific to the county versus the city uniform. But other than that, mostly um, there's some formatting changes as far as the, like the structure. I even think the font is different um, if we want to get that detailed. But for the most part, the goals, the intentions, the training are very similar um, or the same. I mean, there's anything big. It's really the whole goal around this was really making sure that we're still serving our community, responding to the community's needs, that um, there's still the accountability piece on both sides for making sure the training happens, that the data collection and presentation happens, that um, that our community and our stakeholders all know what's going on and when. Um, and so it's going to be fairly consistent between HPD and Washington County. I just wonder if there Alex, do you have anything to add or are there any questions specific to this? Oh, also we are calling it, it's a work agreement. So it's a contract, IGA work agreement are both contracts, but um, just for the terminology, that's the preferred term. Nope, sounds great, Morgan. Yep, very similar documents in spirit and in letter. Martin, I don't know if I'm allowed to call on you or if there's a formal process. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I can, yeah, Martin, you have your hand raised up. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Morgan, and thank you, um, Public Safety Chief Alex O. Um, just to be clear, uh, this is everything outside of HPD's turf. So this would be North Plains City, our part of Cornelius City, and all of unincorporated Washington County outside of Hillsborough, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, I don't see any other hands up. So um, I just wanna say thank you, Morgan and Alex for your work on this um, and getting us um, this fairly quickly turned around as well, right after the other one. So I'm happy that they're both um, around the same timing for us to be um, still on schedule to review them. Um, so thank you again for your work. And I don't see any other board members with questions, but I know that, that we all appreciate this effort. And it's been a long time, but we're here. Okay, everyone, our next item is in-person in -person learning up update with Travis. Actually, I'm going to kick that one off. Um, let me uh, just just kind of reflect a little bit. We have been in conversation at the state level to start working to understand what the potential um, changes to the, uh, the guidance for schools is going to be as we move into the 21-22 school year. And so we're, we're starting to get some insight into what that might include. And some of those things that um, could, some of the significant shifts that could be out there on the horizon could be a, a retiring or a moving away from the, the school metrics when it comes to the number of cases in the, in the region. Uh, I think there's, um, there's going to be a moving away from the hybrid model. There's discussion about that at the state level. Of course, that goes hand in hand, that will need to go hand in hand with the guidance because one of the reasons we're in the hybrid model is because of the guidance. That's the only way we're able to meet the requirements of that guidance. And um, there's been a lot of conversation about authority shifts occurring. So um, potentially more authority given at the local level as opposed to the state level uh, when it comes to decision-making regarding schools. And that of course will be a, be a change. Um, there is a significant conversation going around 
the mental health support that students will need. And that's, that's something that uh, we've been working on in our district for the last uh, month or so and putting together plans um, to make sure that that occurs as we start to welcome students back in a, in a more typical manner. Um, of course, there's still variables out there that are going to influence the guidance and um, really is what's causing the guidance, the new guidance not to come out until mid-July. We, of course, would love for it to come out sooner than that so that um, we have the information well ahead of time. But uh, as we know, the virus continues to change. And um, the thought is that the longer we can wait to make that, the longer the state can make to uh, wait can to make that decision, the more accurate information we'll have and we'll be able to uh, make the best decisions possible. So the variables, of course, have to do with the variants that are out there and how that reacts um, the availability of vaccinations. That is something that even over the last couple of weeks, we've seen more and more availability and, and we see it being offered to students now. Um, the number of cases, of course, if that, uh, if that ramps up again, there would, there, that would have ramifications on the guidance. Um, other considerations would be making sure that districts are using the most effective instructional models available to them as, as it lands within the guidance that has been presented. Uh, cohorting is under discussion. Uh, right now there's rules around the number of uh, kids that people interact with. And so there's discussions around that as well as the seasonal impacts of COVID and what it's going to look like moving forward the more that has been learned about COVID um, and how that changes depending on the time of year that we're in. Some of the constants that we believe are going to remain are face coverings and physical distancing. Um, we think those are going to be in place as we move to um, to fall 21. So those are some of the guidance discussions that are currently going on. We'll have the opportunity in the next uh, several weeks to start getting um, a preview of some of the drafts that are out there and then offering some, uh, some feedback once we start to see those drafts. Uh, that's what I wanted to share with you. Um, Travis, I believe you're up next. Thanks, Mike. So just a quick snapshot of the updated metrics. Go ahead, Martin. Sorry, I didn't see your hand before I started jabbering. Oh, oh thank you. Uh, just a quick one for Mike. If you see, as the as the age limit drops for vaccinations, do you think that's going to become a mandatory thing um, for you know public school attendance? Is there discussions around that? Not that I'm inviting that, but right, right. that discussion is going to come. Is it started already? There's there's speculation about it. Um, I. I don't know is the shorter answer, um, but there's there's conversations starting about that and where that's going to land. I just wouldn't want to speculate yet, but um, there's definitely conversation and, and just discussion around that. Thank you. Thanks, Mike and Martin. Um, so just the, the traditional graph that we show catching you up that we have maybe plateaued and the last two weeks gone down from 206 to 200 cases per 100,000, which is positive, still high, but um, we aren't seeing the spike continue the way we were for several consecutive weeks there. Uh, please advance one. Ugo. And I wanted to give you a brief overview of some of the work that we're doing around our learning acceleration plan. Um, you know that we've been looking at state dollars for the summer and federal dollars looking into the next couple of years in order to accelerate learning for students. Our ODE summer grants include a K-8 grant, a high school grant, and then a child care grant for students in grades K through five, which equal somewhere around seven to $8 million for us. Right now we are in full steam ahead mode on planning for those uh, programs so that by June 17th, we have a plan, we've communicated with our community and we're ready to roll with our summer programming. So. Uh, I won't get into too many details, but I wanted to show you the structures that we've um, created in order to, to accomplish this lift, even while our principals and leaders are winding down the school year with a lot on their plate anyway. Go ahead, one more, please. We're really approaching this like a mini grant application and uh, Michelle and her team in the business office have set up a template where we can both budget and put uh, program requirements together in an electronic way and track these program applications in the background. If I'm a principal today, I'm working with my teacher leaders and families to create summer programming that gets kids engaged, excited about school, gets them on campus, and that's really exciting. 
if I'm a principal today, I'm also a little bit scared about, okay, so how do I create all these partnerships and get this programming up and running if summer school is not normal for me? So go ahead and advance one more. We put to, um, we're trying to attach all the partners and network all the partners we have in the region to make exciting programming happen. This is a graphic that was shared with us by the Portland Metro STEM partnership. We've been a part of this partnership for about 10 years now. Uh, we're one of the founding district members and you can't see it here and you're not supposed to, but this, these little honeycombs are networks of uh, quasi-governmental agencies, not-for-profits, educational entities outside of K-12, community partners, culturally specific organizations, and they've created this constellation of partners in the Portland Metro STEM partnership. Right now, we have liaisons connecting our teachers and our principals to OMSI, the zoo, wind and ore, Jackson Bottom Wetlands, et cetera, so that they can be part of this. Um, they can leverage these resources for summer programming. How are we doing that? Click one more slide, please, Ugo. We've set up the summer school super group um, between Michelle on the money side and me on the program side, and then some of our facilities crew in the wings. We have our coordinators and directors leading mini teams. The mini teams can help principals and teacher leaders set up math and literacy acceleration programs, and then be partnership builders for engagement across our community. We also have a small team dedicated to mental health direct supports when kids come back in in the summer and have any kinds of needs from mental health therapy, drug and alcohol support. We know needs are gonna emerge and we're ready to uh, provide services. This is all an effort to help our principals stand up programming in June, uh, July and August. Uh, keep going one more, please. So just wanted to give you a couple of high level highlights our K-8 summer programs will focus on engaging activities to support learning, acceleration in math literacy and social emotional learning and family engagement. You can see some partners li listed there like OMSI, Play Fit Fun, Portland Metro, uh, Jack, Jackson Bottom, Right Brain, et cetera. And also our partners at the city will be helping us um, integrate engagement with academics. At high school, we'll focus on credit attainment. There's a big push right after school gets out every year, but even more this year to help students reach the finish line before July. And the city of Hillsboro and PCC are gonna help us get student tutors and mentors into programming and college level coursework. We also have uh, mental health supports that I alluded to earlier, ready to go. So that's in a nutshell, our summer scope. Martin, do you still have your, do you have your hand up freshly or still from the last topic? That was operator error on my part. Sorry, Travis. All good. All good. Um, if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I'll pass to Beth Grazer with graduation updates and vaccination updates. Okay. Um, had to give a little pause there to see if there were any questions, but I'm happy to provide an update on our graduation planning. And as of right now, we are still moving towards our plan of holding two different types of events for each of our comprehensive high schools, being one being the in-person, more traditional graduation event at the Hillsborough Stadium, and the other option being a drive-through model that we would hold at Hare Field. So um, we are, like I said, making all the preparations and plans for having both options operational, but we will make our final decision after the governor's announcement on June 1st, which will be her risk level designations for the two weeks that will start on June 4th and go through the 18th. So based on what she says, then we will make that determination of whether or not we have to revert to all drive through or can, can pull off both. And I think we had a meeting this afternoon, myself, Casey and Dave Peterson in facilities. I think where we're at is that as long as we're not in the extreme risk category, we feel confident that we can indeed pull off the in-person graduation ceremonies for each of our comprehensive high schools, which is great. And we're very hopeful that we can uh, stay out of extreme. We're going, starting to head back in the right direction. Of course, we would hope to be in low risk, at least moderate, because that will allow us to get more uh, family members in the stands. 
regardless, we will be live streaming the event at the stadium and also at Harefield so that family members who can't be present can watch that. We will also be creating videos afterward. They'll be a little bit different than the videos we did last year, just because last year with everything being drive through, we kind of had to have a bit of a different cadence to that, but um, we will be providing that once again to students and families. Uh, if you want to advance one, Hugo, I just put in a few pictures of last year's drive through graduations, just as kind of a reminder of, of what we did. And granted, this was at the Hillsborough Stadium, but our plan would be to have a very similar setup at Hare Field. Uh, because it is our property, we have a lot more leeway in terms of how we set up and prepare, which is kind of nice. I think we're going to be able to actually do some uh, painting on the pavement, you know, to help uh, mark things out. Obviously, we can set up our own cones and um, devise our own process for the staging and, and that kind of thing. But we have permit talks in place with the city to make sure that we're good with traffic flow and all the staging and tenting and sound and lights and all of that is um, has been arranged and is ready to go. We have photographers hopefully that will will be there as long as Life Touch can uh, secure them for both locations, but we are planning on that. And um, right now, really the only big thing we have left to do is to devise a contingency plan if we do in fact have to revert everyone to the drive through model. If that's the case, we will probably have to um, elongate our timeline. Well, we definitely will because that is just a lot of students to get through the drive through model. And right now, each school is only slotted for, I believe, three and a half hours to get their drive through students through. And that is only about a third as much time as they would likely need. So just need to kind of start working out that contingency plan so that it can be enacted right away if that's the direction we have to go. So um, Erica, yeah, you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering, I guess, what has been the, um, the planning feedback that we've gotten from families about how many are we, are you planning? Yeah, I, it's a little bit variant between high schools, but I think it's, pretty much what we expected with about two thirds wanting to do in person and between two thirds and three quarters wanting to do in person and between a quarter and a third uh, choosing the drive through model. That's kind of the way it's playing out right now. Um, I, unless there are other graduation related questions, I think we can move to the vaccination update. So as you know, there um, previously was approval for 16 and 17 year olds to be vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine. And so we collaborated with other local school districts and the Northwest Regional ESD to create opportunities for our students and their unvaccinated family members to kind of uh, take advantage of these group sign up opportunities through the Oregon Convention Center. And so we devised a Google form that they could fill out to do that. We arranged for transportation for those who needed that for last week's clinic on Wednesday the 5th. And we, we really were kind of the trailblazer school district for all that. We were the first ones to bring buses. We were kind of the test case for, for all of that. And it really went very smoothly. So I think we have a lot to, to be proud of there. And, um, approximately 100 students and family members uh, took advantage of that opportunity and got their first shots last Wednesday. And we will be, for those who needed the transportation, we will be taking them back again on the 26th so they can get their booster shot. Um, you may have seen in our update that we sent out on Friday and then again kind of reiterated in Monday's hot news, a lot of clinics are starting to open up the availability to community members where they don't need any appointments. They, they're really starting to see that drop off in vaccination demand. And so just trying to make it as easy as possible for people, lower those barriers to entry. Um, there's even some clinics happening at our Virginia Garcia centers, which is great because 
having a west side option is I think going to be really helpful to our, our families who either don't feel comfortable or have reliable transportation out as far as the airport or the Oregon Convention Center. Uh, we are still, even though we're not planning uh, bus, big bus trips for other Wednesdays that are upcoming, other than that return trip for the students on the 26th, we do have the capability to help arrange transportation if a student or family member indicates that that's a hardship for them. So Alma Hernandez is our point person for that, and she does a fabulous job with everything she does, which you heard just a moment ago, also includes child, all things childcare. So uh, we're really fortunate to have Alma. Um, if you wanna progress one more slide, hold for a couple seconds. It's just another picture of our students. They're at the convention center last Wednesday, um, going through their very orderly process. And then here are just some of the things that I was mentioning. So that Google form that we created as of today, there had been 213 students who responded to that survey and um, just over a third signed up at least one other family member, which is great. So that's, I think, really um, been a helpful thing for our students and families. And then um, just a little update because I know it might be on people's minds as far as vaccination for 12 to 15 year olds that did receive federal emergency use authorization, but it has not yet received approval from Oregon. Oregon still wants to do some of their own vetting of the, the research results and to make sure that they feel comfortable with 12 to 15 year olds getting the vaccine. That is anticipated as early as tomorrow, which means that as early as potentially Thursday, they could start vaccinating 12 to 15 year olds. And what we've heard is that anyone who is, so 15 is that magic cutoff age for being able to self-refer for medical treatment. So anyone 14 or younger would need to have signed approval from a parent or guardian to get a vaccine and would need to be accompanied by an adult at the convention center. As of right now, we don't have plans for doing any sort of mass transportation of younger students to those vaccination opportunities, but we're happy to share information and to make those connections so that people feel informed and um, can go get vaccinated if they so choose. And just one last thing kind of to Martin's question earlier about requiring the vaccination. I think there is some thought that it may be something that we see uh, in a year or two, but while these vaccines are only under emergency use authorization and don't have FDA approval uh, per se, and also because there are still so many ages that we cover in our system that aren't yet, that don't even have the emergency use authorization, I think it'll be a little ways before we see any kind of move to add those vaccines to our required immunizations for students. All right, that's it for the updates. Thank you. Thank you. Um, board members, our last item uh, on our agenda is just discussion time. So I will start with our student representatives to see if they have any um, items. I see Maya, you're on here. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry, I wasn't able to have my camera on tonight, but I just wanted to emphasize how um, thankful I feel that the board um, values the student voice so much. And I can really tell by um, the way everyone talks um, just about students and their opinions um, in every meeting we have. So I just want to thank you all for that. Thank you, Maya. Okay, um, next uh, superintendent, do you have any I don't have anything additional to add this evening. I know that a number of you have election races, so good luck next Tuesday. Thank you. Okay, next, um, I'll just go down the opposite way that I started. So Yadira, do you have any discussion items? No, I don't have anything extra. Just All right. Good luck everyone next Tuesday. Thank you. Um, next, we have uh, Mark and then Lisa, you're on, uh, sorry, Martin, and then Mark, you're on deck. 
Nothing to add. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mark. Rob Brain brief. That's cool. I'm two shots in two weeks tomorrow. So pretty happy about that. Um, I do have one little minor suggestion I wanted to bring up. It's very silly little minor thing that uh, I don't know if you noticed last time in our main session, I stole it from the legislature um, doing a roll call vote. I think it, uh, what the legislature does is they say their name and their vote, just in case in this virtual world, somebody accidentally gets dis disconnected or it, it's just, oh, it, so what you heard with me say, Watson votes yes, or Watson votes no or something. So the, they're doing that in the legislature in these virtual sessions. And I would just suggest that it might be something we'd want to adopt in case in the middle of a roll call vote, somebody gets disconnected, some other person doesn't jump in and say yes, and we don't know who it was and you just catalog their vote as a yes. So little tiny thing, don't need to do it, just a thought. That makes sense. No wonder you were doing that. I was like, why is he doing that? Now that makes sense. <laughs> I was like, you're just referring to yourself in the third person now. <laughs> Which is super weird. I'm not a big fan of that, but yeah. Thanks for the follow up. Um, next we have Jackie, uh, sorry, Lisa and then Jackie. All right, good evening, everyone. I don't have a, a lot to add except for, uh, as, as has been mentioned, there is an election. Um, a week from today, ballots are due no later than 8 p.m. on Tuesday, May 18th. So make sure that you vote. There are always important things on that ballot. So of course we have a school district election, which is um, you know very, very important. There's also um, other special districts as well that might be on your ballot. So make sure you take the time to fill that out top to bottom and get it turned in. Thank you, Lisa. Jackie? Um, well, I had something and then I forgot, but I do want to commend everyone here. We are trailblazers. Our district is trailblazers in more than one occasion and in more than one instance. And the the COVID shots and the, the, the coordination of getting families and students, that is just one example of how awesome you guys all are in thinking outside the box. So thank you for doing that. It, I mean, you have created, you've worked together and we've created a community that a lot of districts don't have. And so congratulations. I, 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 I think that's awesome. Thank you. Thanks Jackie. And um, I echo those sentiments and also um, want to just um, reiterate that our board backs you up and that we like when you think outside the box and when you're creative and innovative um, in service to our community and to our students. So with that, I uh, adjourn our board meeting. Good night, everybody. <laughs>